Okay, um, so uh, let's talk about what are Europe otherettes. So before we delve into the history of the European consideration of the others, I would like to give a short explanation of what are who are Europe uh, Europe otherettes. So otherettes refers to others, those who seem similar to oneself, but who become different in comparison. That is to say, otherness appears in cultural exchanges when we are confronted with someone who is not me. This exchange can be interpreted in a positive or negative way. So we are not like them or we are similar to them. Because of this, the principle of otherness has been used throughout history as a strategy to forge a collective identity and sense of belonging and legitimize established power. Although the presence of another may jeopardize the group's identity and could create an identity crisis, it also facilitates the internal cohesion of group members. This way, a dualistic distribution of identities is produced in relationship with opposites, which through similarity and analogies builds relationship based on inclusion and exclusion. So you can picture this as a chessboard when it's really clearly and distinctly establishes what separates us from the others. It is worth noting that the other is not a fixed category, but a malleable and complex relationship that could be invoked at different times and for different aims. If we consider European history, the appreciation of others was very unstable, changing in accordance with the motives and interests of the time, the areas they described, the scale of the, represent of the descriptions from very local to extremely general views, the media and channels of dissemination and the context in which these depictions were produced. However, it is undeniable that this continuously changing definitions of otherness played an important part in creating a mirror image of Europeanness. So we will start going through what was the conception of the other through the early modern history, so from the 1500s to the 1800s. Even though interpreting the evolution of the European conception of the other is particularly a complicated task, if we go back to early modern history and the 15th century, the publications made by colonizers, mercants, missionaries and mercenaries contributed to widening Europeans' understanding of the world. However, they did not provide a straightforward reflection of the environment, physical appearance, economical activities, social structure and religious practices of the people described. Uh, the historical documents from the time are replete with information about how Europeans perceive, perceive what they encounter. So these ethnographical descriptions were in various ways structured and distorted according to the European mentalities and cultural frameworks of the time. Religious beliefs highly influenced these frameworks, as these were terms that, the terms by which Europeans primarily expressed their identity, uh, but also geographical, political and cultural frameworks were of, of importance. There were two forms of pre existing knowledge uh, that were particularly important for the Europeans trying to make sense of new environment. The first one was uh, that they used often everyday experiences of their own customs, ways of speaking, social hierarchies, foods, animals, and so on to compare themselves to others. And secondly, they also drew from classical sources describing um, geographical areas far away from the Mediterranean. So for example, Aristotle spoke about extreme climate zones and a middle area where civilization flourished and Herodotus produced enduring depictions of exter external variants. And there were many other formal and informal modes of knowledge that strengthened the frameworks within which Europeans could see, compare and talk about the worlds of the others. So during early modern history, Europeans often resorted to a scale to explain the diversity of populations and costumes and country in describing the other. So specific areas of human groups were considered more or less irreligious and more or less barbarian when compared to other parts of the, of the world. A particularly influential hierarchy of non-Christian others was produced by the Spanish missionary Jose de Acosta, who divided non-European barbarians into three times, according to Acosta, the Chinese were similar to the ancient Greeks and Romans because they lived within clear political structures and possess a written culture. The Incas in Peru and Aztecs in Mexico also have powerful monarchies but lack a writing system. And finally, a third age group contained all those with no law and, lack and that lack political structures and fixed settlements. So explicitly or implicitly, Europeans often produce this kind of gradation to others and the others and to justify their plans for religious evangelization and the destruction of local customs. So all the multidirectional context proliferated between different regions of the world during this period, it was the American continent that Europeans found more alien in relation to their existing frameworks. This feeling of surprise and astonishment is not comparable to encounters with other parts of the, world, of the globe. 
Since antiquity, Europeans have cultivated knowledge of Africa, even if incomplete and distorted, and interaction with different parts of Asia dates back to millennia. So in conclusion, during early modern European history, the descriptions and ideas of the others were, to pro uh, were the product of real life interactions based on conquest, colonization, trade, exploitation, and military confrontation. But these perceptions and debates also determine how these human groups were treated and the kinds of relationships that Europeans established with them. In numerous parts of the world, but particularly in the Americas and through the enslavement of African populations, the European disruption was substantial and lethal. The American population was disseminated by Eurasian diseases such as smallpox, measles, and many others. And partly to replace these population losses of around 8.6 uh, million slave people from different parts of the Africa continent were forced to work on plantations in the Americas between the, 15, the 1500s and the 1800s. This forced migration of Africans to the Americas and the Caribbean changed not only the demography of these regions, but also provided the backdrop for the systematic development of racism and discrimination based on skin color, where modern categories of black and white had their origins. So now moving forward and history to the modern history in the between the 1800s and the 1920s. The world grew closer through transport and communication of past advances, making political and cultural differences more openly visible. Additionally, the rise of Europe as the world's dominant power during the 18th century profoundly shaped how Europeans understood the rest of the world and themselves. At the beginning of the century, several European empires controlled 30% of the world's landmass. By the eight, uh, 1860s, uh, the number had risen to 60%, and in 1914, to an astonishing 80%. But new international actors like the United States and Japan came into play as well. So this global movement allowed contact with people living, from different, uh, living different lifestyles and cultures than in the Europeans. And disciplines like anthropology arose as a response to give meaning to these encounters, and its first theory was that of cultural evolution. So in the 19th century, the operation of the Darwinist theory of evolution offered a coherent scientific framework to speak about the existence of different species through the diversity of environments where natural selection takes place. So to explain the existence of human others, Darwin's theory was transposed to society. To uh, this allowed for the hierarchization of the world, and you might be familiar with the concept of the first, second, and third world, which is based on the idea that European climate and natural resources explain the fact that one of the world's most advanced societies developed there, while the extreme climates and lack of natural resources in other parts, like Africa, Asia, and the Arctic, lock humanity into a prior and primitive evolutionary stage. From here, anthropologists develop evolutionist theories based on the idea that societies must ultimately pass through the same stages to arrive at a common end. So it was Montesquieu who proposed an evolutionary scheme based on three stages, hunting or savagery, herding or barbarism, and civilization. It is important to note that these um, anthropological and ethnographical theories are in depictions by, uh, of other societies were not first-hand recollections. So European social scientists, both the travel diaries of sailors, soldiers, missionaries, colonial administrators, and other explorers, and base their, idea, their theories on those. So most of the time, they never visit the countries they talk about, and this type of anthropology is known as amateur anthropology. And it is mainly characterized by an ethnocentric way of thinking about the other, which simply put, it means that anthropology standard to measure those cultures from their own vantage points and draw comparisons to their cultures. So all these societies that did not fit into the European standards were put into the lower stages of social evolution, legitimizing colonization in a paternalistic way. We got to help them evolve. However, it was not the same all over the world, and not all societies were considered inferior. So, for example, the United States was considered as the embodiment of the political ideas from the European Enlightenment and ascended to economic power while evolving into a new social and political model that was considered part of this civilized world. However, European views of the, Europe, the US range from admiration to aversion, and many liberal and democratic-minded uh, Europeans were fascinated by this new constitutional democratic country on the other side of the Atlantic, even though it was racially exclusive. But at the same time, many European intellectuals was voiced an aversion to America's apparent shallowness, lack of intellectual creativity, and bourgeois mediocrity often accompanied by a critic of consumerism and mass culture, as well as growing fears of Europe's Americanization. 
Some observers went even further and condemned what they consider capitalism taken to the extreme, symbolized by events like the expulsion of Native Americans from their homelands, driven by land speculation or production sites, like the famous Chicago slaughterhouse. And yet some of the critics saw a particularly European dimension in the expanding of American civilization. So in the picture, you can see um, Nicolas Jalès, the depiction of a Native America chieftain that is facing a majestic female representing European civilization. And it is to make clear that the aggressive expansion of American civilization was but an offspring of European expansion on Asian money. So another, um, the other other of uh, Europe was Asia. So European representation of Asia varied in scope, quality, and the sense of temporality. Asia is the only continent that is not separated from Europe uh, by sea. So both Europe and Asia are perceived and as historically and culturally distant entities that are situated on this common Eurasian landmass without a definite, like a distinctly uh, border. So the question of what Asia meant to Europe and vice versa was and still is a question of what exactly counts as part of Europe and as part of Asia. So in the early 18th century, Russian Enlightenment thinkers wanting to prove that the Russian Empire was European developed the idea that the dividing and border was in the Ural Mountains. So as Europe's other, uh, Asia was framed as a counterweight and perceived either on equal terms or on normative grounds. So such, these representations carried different assumptions of temporality, including schemes of linear progress and the possibility of different paths to modernity. So was Asia preceding Europe lagging or that rather was it developing at its own pace? European images of Asia were intertwined with Asian self-perceptions derived, derived from the depictions of Europe in the same way that European representation of Asia carried implicit representation of Europe itself. So, however, this positive image changed in the early 19th century. Um, while Europe economic and technical superiority was displayed in the Industrial Revolution, Europe others appear to feel uh, fall behind on the track to modernity. And in 1820, the German philosophy, uh, philosopher Hegel judged that China possessed no history and that it had not been able to develop and was thus forced to remain ancient. On the other side, there were regions that came to be collectively known as the Middle East at the start of the 20th century, were namely the regions of the Levant, Mesopotamia, the Arabian Peninsula, Persia, and Asia Minor, as well as the African continent, were both sources of opportunities and threats in European eyes. After the loss of the Americas, the Middle East of Africa became this critical strategic gateways to Europe. They provided a valuable market and resources that helped sustain European co economies and uphold political stability. So even though the Middle East was never colonized, each major European empire still established dominance in certain parts of the region. So they started control over the Ottoman and Persian economies by signing free trade agreements with the local authorities during politically turbulent times for these empires. So local monopolies were abolished and custom tariffs for European exports and imports were lowered, much to the benefit of the Western metropoles. So to sum up, during the 18th and 19th centuries, Europeans opened China, the Ottoman Empire, and Persia to the circuits of global free trade, which continue over decades to impoverish local economies. Local resistance movements and anti-colonial rebellions, such as the Boxer War, came to be associated in Western countries with Eastern barbarity, Islamic fanatism, and the Yellow Peril. Only Japan and the United States made their way into the privileged rank of Greek powers with their own imperial expansionism in the name of civilization at the end of the 19th century. So at this point, the context for a new international order was set, uh, but it will take two world of wars for this new order to take shape. So moving over to the contemporary history, if the 19th century saw the assertion of Europe as a global power, the 20th century was a heyday and decline of European dominance. The rise of a divided world order after the Second World War replaced many old colonial linkages. So European societies continued to cling to their system of truth and narrative, considering their supremacy almost natural and a product of unique qualities. To justify this narrative, Europeans created, as in previous centuries, a stable ideational structures about other communities. During this time, we can also talk about an internal and an external order. The external being a historical order since the early modern history, the former colonies and the big powers of modern history like the US and Japan. However, we must not forget that colonization and imperialism are not only in one direction and also implied round trips between colonies and colonizers. So since the 15th century, people from Africa, America, Asia and Oceania were moving to and around Europe. 
becoming minority groups of others within the European majority, many of which are still present and othered in today's Europe. Additionally, the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century were marked by extreme nationalists that target those not belonging to the religious, racial, and political ideologies. The best example is Nazi Germany and the persecution of Jewish, Roman, Sinti, political opponents, the LGBTQ plus collective, and many more that did not fit their racial laws or national socialist ideology. However, they were not the only ones, and in many European countries, people from the former colonies, like indigenous people from Africa and Latin America, were shown in human souls where Europeans could admire their exotic um, behavior, and racist publications maintained the othering of racial, religious, and political minorities. So, however, um, even though this conceptation, this conceptation of the historical others change, uh, we should take a look at how Africa, the Middle East, and the US and Asia and Latin America are conceptualized in other in contemporary history. So the African other representation in the 20th century did not significantly change. The dissolution of European empires over the 20th century evidently changed Europe's relationship with the African continent. So the process of political decolonization represented a new stage in this relationship. However, there still were attempts by European colonizers to maintain control by modifying certain rules in the colonial system. For example, on July 5, 1998, the Spanish newspaper ABC argued that African decolonization was premature and the forms of nationalism created were akin to placing a loaded bomb in the hands of a child. Mentoring is required for these child-minded people and their ideas and their leaders. So we can count on three mainstream representations of Africa in today's Europe. The first is Africa of misery, focusing on situations of extreme poverty and instability, famine, sexual violence, and a lack of basic sanitation on the continent. This image goes beyond an economic perspective and enters the sphere of morality. Africans do not have things, they are underdeveloped because they cannot supposedly manage their own wealth. As such, they are often visually represented as nude, suffering from the ravages of hunger and inhabiting stark in hospital environments. This depiction of Africa justifies and makes necessary military and charitable interventions by non-governmental and humanitarian organizations. The second is the infantilization of African people um, that characterizes uh, this second imaginary construct. So according to this image, the African continent represents the infancy of humanity. At the same time, Europe, in contrast, has expanded to the adult stage. So it's clearly linked to the evolution of series of the 18th century. For example, the famous Belgian comic book series, The Adventures of Tintin, created in the 1930s, included a re revealing example of this infantilization. The second volume, Tintin in the Congo from 1931, displays a paternalistic vision of the Congo, whose inhabitants are presented as primitive, barbaric, and uncivilized. They are grateful for the presence of the colonizers who appear to bring forth progress and development in their societies through medicine or education. In one particularly controversial scene in the book, a Congolese woman who is grateful to the white protagonist Tintin for healing her husband exalts him with exclamation, white woman, white man is great. So while Europeans, always white men, are portrayed as heroes, non-white people are portrayed in a potentially offensive, offensive and racist way. They are passive, submissive, and in need of care and akin to children. The third imaginary construct is that of the exotic Africa. Characterized by its natural parks, animals, typically lions, leopards, giraffes, elephants, and so on, as well as its exotic cultural and natural landscapes. According to this construct, Europe must assume responsibility for preserving Africa's natural environment through the intervention of numerous NGOs by conserving natural resources and promoting true development in the sense, in this sense, Africa has become an emblematic example of the contradictions in Western discourses on environmental preservation, development, and the defense of human rights. In reality, these imaginaries are ways of deconstructing the dignity of the other. Upon closer analysis, what becomes evident is that the projects that projects this wish uh, this case, disguised as humanitarian initiatives or other ethical justifications are acts of violence towards the other. These African other representations have been challenged mainly by anti-racist and decolonizing movements and activists in the last few years. The most renowned one is the Black Lives Matter movement, which since the murder of George Floyd in 2020 has gained more visibility and has fostered debates about Europe's colonial past and the representation of the colonial order. Moving to the Middle East, what is widely accepted is that the term Middle East was invaded by Anglo-American strategies as a semantic and geographical category at the turn of the 20th century. 
In other words, from its inception, the term Middle East describes an entire region through their ge geographical reference to Europe and is an Eurocentric perception of the world. Politically, culturally, and economically, it also helped identify Europe through a process of othering, which superficially associated the West with progress, civilization, and development, and the East with the binary opposite of those categories. The end of World War II and the ensuing decolonization process coincided with the foundation of Israel and a period of rising Arab nationalism put the task alongside attempts of na at nationalism in the old industries. So in this region's history, we can uh, discern at least two turning points um, for the European other, othering of the Middle East. The first one was the Suez, uh, the Suez crisis in 1956. So the desire of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, Nasser to nationalize the Suez Canal went against the treaties imposed by, in the 19th century by Britain and France. So Nasser plan was met with ridicule. He was portrayed as a couscous Mussolini by the Western press. But he also sparked fears that his plan could jeopardize one of the main oil routes to the West. The second event was also linked to oil. It was the 1973 oil crisis triggered when the organization of Aryan Arab petroleum exporting countries halted oil exports to the United States and Europe to negate Western and European support to Israel during the Arab-Israeli war. The resulting crisis demonstrates that Middle Eastern countries have become essential sources of political and economic vigor and stability to Europe, not to mention in the post-war recovery. As Europe's Asia, um, as Europe's other, Asia provided mirror images that helped foster a sense of European identity. So in the 19th century, representations of China, for example, shifted from a civilized Europe of the East to an Asian country without history or even an evil general peril. After the Second World War, all their assumptions about Europe's relationship with Asia were threatened and challenged by Cold War divisions. With the socialist bloc emerging in Eastern Europe, the idea of Europe as a liberal realm seemed to dismiss it. As a result, an anti-communist red scare was built on all the narratives of the dangerous and evil East. For example, in August 1949, a few months before China will also turn communist, the conservative Christian Democratic Union of West Germany portrayed a gloomy Asian-looking Bolshevik seizing whole of Europe, as you can see in the image. On the other hand, left-wing intellectuals in Cold War Western Europe were inspired by communist China as an alternative to Western capitalism and Soviet socialism. Paradoxically, Mao became a symbol of domestic protest among parts of European youth rebelling against older generations that were perceived to run a repressive state. Regarding North America, in the 20th century, comp uh, North American companies became vital in European economic life. This new economic influence also allowed cultural contacts, so European cultural life was beginning to be reshaped by the American feature films and just music. However, North America's economy and cultural influence sparked fears on both sides of the political spectrum over its cultural imperialism and its economic colonization of Europe. Both right-wing and left-wing observers thought that their homeless had lost the part of their sovereignty due to the effects of US popular culture and consumerism. They felt that this phenomenon had changed Europe attitudes to the extent that millions of Europeans had been Americanized. So for example, the British newspaper Daily Express published in 1927 that the consumption of Hollywood movies had turned millions of British people into temporary American citizens. However, this criticism should not be confused with anti-Americanism, since many critics did not regard America as evil or an enemy. So although different sentiments towards the US were mostly consistent during the 20th century, their acceptance shifted over time and from country to country and between age groups. So for example, just after the Second World War, the scientific prestige of America increased immensely thanks to the financial possibilities offered by American research institutions and the great number of European sci scientists who had moved there. But during the 1960s and 1970s, the Vietnam War shaped European perceptions of the US more negatively because the conflict appeared to be evidence of American imperialism, which was also dangerous to Europe. Now, at last, moving to Latin America, um, European scholars often approach the countries of Latin America as a relatively homogeneous bloc, assuming their national identities to be rooted in the shared colonial past and associated Spanish and Portuguese heritage. Simplistic references to Latin America exclude the strong legacies of Amerindian and African communities in the history and culture of these nations. 
Although the region's countries were dependent on foreign powers and organizations for several centuries, it is clear that the 20th century initiated a new stage in relations between Europe and Latin America, especially after the two world wars. However, certain former imperial metropoles attempted to revisit symbols of their colonial past to forge new relationship with their former colonies. So, for example, the Francoist dictatorship in Spain founded Alice in Pinochet's Chile, in Perón's, Perón's Argentina, Estresner's Paraguay, Somoza's Nicaragua, and Trujillo's Dominican Republic. So, together, they form a great network of dictatorial governments that set in motion profound repressive mechanism against their political opposition. So, to conclude, the other and other in have always been open-ended discursive practices devoid of fixed content. The others have always been operationalized to justify colonial or neo-colonial control in European imagination, rarely corresponding to historical reality. Furthermore, sometimes the depiction of the other tells us more about Europe's self-perfection than the reality in those other countries and minorities. So Europe's representation of the other has held different functions and connotations at different times. We could conclude that the othering has helped Europe style itself as exceptional continent distinguished from the rest. In political discourse, popular culture and international relations, Europeans still often refer to stereotypes such as infantile Africans, despotic Orientals, or consumerist Americans to describe the world, implying a European superiority in the process. And that is everything for me. Thank you.